Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, we were recently in L.A. talking with Eric Mann from the Los Angeles Bus Riders Union. Find out why working people from L.A. are attending the climate talks in Paris. And then listen in on my conversation with Pedro Paez from Ecuador. He was the nation's former finance minister when they renegotiated loans, cut debt payments, and reinvested in the local economy. All that and a few words from me on learning from a 19th century African statue. It's all coming up. Welcome to our program. Displacement, genocide, and climate crimes. Is that a laundry list or a web of connected crises? Our next guest has been helping people's movements make the links for decades now. He's Eric Mann of the Labor Community Strategy Center right here in Los Angeles. He's also the author of a slew of books, including L.A.'s Lethal Air, Taking on General Motors, Playbook for Progressives, The 16 Qualities of the Successful Organizer, and Katrina's Legacy, White Racism and Black Reconstruction in New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. He's working on a new edition. He's host of KPFK, Pacifica's Voices from the Front Lines, Welcome to the program, Eric. Glad to have you. Thank you, Laura. It's fun to be with you. So I was reminded, going back to your um, one of your many books, that you got your start just listening to a speech, listening to someone talk. Who was that? Well, there were a series of them, but the first was, I mean, one of the things I was thinking about is a lot of young people to say, hey, man, are you into spoken word? I said, you didn't invent spoken word. <laughs> I had to break it to you. Malcolm and Martin Luther King, and yes, my life was changed. I was at Cornell University, a Jewish kid from Brooklyn and Long Island, and I thought I was gonna be a big Democratic Party loser in retrospect. And uh, this young black man from SNCC came up and said, we want you to picket the Woolworths. They wanted us to boycott in Ithaca, New York, and I was, of course, ready. And then he said, but the problem is, you white people, he says, you know, you think you're going to just go down to Woolworths and help me? You think I want to die for a sandwich? Do you think my life is just about a sandwich? What are you doing with your life? And I went, wait a minute, I, wasn't com I was coming here to help you. What are you telling me? And the concept of being challenged, which I think is critical to how I work now, to pose a moral challenge, to create some uncomfortableness in the human psyche. Mm -hmm. And I went home and kept saying, almost like sounding a classic light li white liberal, who are you to tell me what to do? I'm just gonna, and I was, and the next morning I woke up and said, I wanna get out of Cornell. I wanna get out of this whole scene. I had been a, uh, working in the South Bronx with young black and Puerto Rican kids. I realized that's where I wanna go. That's where I wanna make my life. So that man started asking me to go to Woolworths. I, and, he said, oh, and he said, who wants to join the civil rights revolution? And contrary to the theory that this was all soft stuff, and I went to work for the Congress of Racial Equality when I got out of college. Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney were killed just before I joined, and that's been the rest of my life. There's so much in what you just said, that the personal experience, the revolutionary vision, the changing of the he to we, that's what you teach at the Strategy Center. How did you get started? Well. <clears throat> I come out of a Jewish, socialist, uh, somewhat anti-communist tradition. Not me, but that's what I come out of. Very strong anti-fascist. It's, it's, it's a joke, but I say that the fascist bastards were the first words that came out of my mouth because that's <laughs> all I kept hearing about fascists and Jews and genocide. And I'm very proud of my parents for not... At five years old, I was thinking about people starving in Europe. Yeah. I didn't know what Europe was. And there's a world made up of goyim who attack us and put us in concentration camps, and we got to fight them. That was the main point. My mom said, stand up to those anti-Semites. Don't let them push us around. So then when I met the black movement, I said, oh, I thought Jews were assertive. Wait till I saw this is the ultimate assertion, the ultimate anger. And what I didn't get before was a revolutionary theory of mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. So when I joined the movement, it was all about do you know about Africa? No. And then we're part of the Indians. What are the Indians? Oh, yeah, and this country is wrong. This country is fundamentally wrong. It's built on the wrong foundations, built on genocide. So I didn't come up with the word. Mm -hmm. I said, wait, genocide, just like what happened? Oh, I remember genocide. That's what my parents taught me about. So quickly I got it. Jews, blacks, Native Americans, the world, people starving. And if you know, King went to divinity school. Mm -hmm. He's doctor of divinity. He studied 
Marx, Niebuhr, Martin Buber, <clears throat> the black movement was very philosophical and very worldview oriented. Yeah. So that's what I teach at the Strategy Center. We're trying to change the world, whether we're on buses. Right now we're doing, Ashley Franklin's doing some amazing organizing in the high schools with young black kids. And just last night I was saying, we have to raise your practice to the level of theory because she's doing teaching with young kids who do not operate off a lot of paradigms that I worked off. Books don't work too well. Long theoretical talks do work, mm -hmm. but combined with things she's trying to figure out. Mm. So I'm sitting down with her and saying, we have to write a book about what you understand mm -hmm. because she's doing at the micro level teaching theory. We've had another one of your, uh, I don't want to say protégés, but colleagues on our program recently, Patrice Cullors from Black Lives <coughs> Matter, who talked about coming up through the Bus Writers Union. Um, if you could say one thing about how you've, what you've learned about creating leadership, about seeing leadership, it, 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 you know, drawing out leadership is probably how you would put it. What is it? How do you make an atmosphere, an environment that cultivates the leadership qualities in people? Well, Patrice and Ashley have two interesting contrasts. And our third is Barbara Lott Holland, who's the associate director of the Strategy Center. She is, uh, came out of the Bus Riders Union. She's grown up in South LA. She's more my age than Patrice and uh, Ashley's, but they're three all black women and interesting differences. Patrice is very, wants the stage, in some way wants to occupy it. Barbara and Ashley do not. And yet, they're all major, major figures. So they all have their different styles of how they operate. So you work with each person to say, you need to lead. That's the main point. Mm -hmm. I, this all, I only have an army of generals. There's no privates, there's no lieutenants. You start as a private, you do. But the goal is I'm getting you to be a general. And this is what my school is about. Uh, and, and that's what SNCC did and CORE did. So many, I mean, if you think about the Panthers and how many leaders they generate. So, when you come to the Strategy Center, it's very demanding. Uh, as I say, you're not supposed to be liked. Yeah. You're not suppo it's not fun. You're supposed to be very introspective. You're supposed to be down on yourself a lot because we're not winning. Mm -hmm. We don't want all this false triumphalism, but we're going to win. Mm -hmm. But only if we look squarely at what the challenge is. And so what I've been trained is life is fundamentally an existential, philosophical engagement, mm -hmm. and the revolution becomes your life. Now, let's check in on that revolution. Okay. Um, while we're probably broadcasting this interview, you will probably be uh, in Paris uh, for the COP21 climate right. summit. Talk a bit about, A, why you've chosen to get so involved in that summit, yes. and B, some of the backstory on the protests, who's involved, and what they hope to get out of it. Yeah, I mean... How does it relate to what you're doing at the Center for well, Starters? Well, my work right now is at the fulcrum of the black movement and climate. Not to the exclusion of, but to give a focus and clarity, even to my own life now. The black movement, because I see it through Martin Delaney, through Frederick Douglass, through Robin D.G. Kelly, who's one of my closest friends and comrades. And he and I, he, he just had the 25th anniversary of... Hammer and Ho, an amazing book mm -hmm. about the Black Communist Party in Alabama. Also a guest on this program. Great. Well, you, 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 <laughs> we have a lot of mutual friends and common taste. Yeah. So, um, so the Black movement, not because it's the most oppressed, but because it's the most philosophically advanced, and it has a history of reaching out. If you ask every gay, woman, Latino, Asian, white, in the, in the 60s, what drove you? They would say the black movement mm -hmm. woke me up to not just my own oppression, but uh, you know, I remember John Scagliotti and I said, how'd you come up with the idea of the Gay Liberation Front? He says, why do you think we called it that? Because we believed in the National Liberation Front of Vietnam. We were not just wanting gay marriage, we wanted to overthrow the government as part of being queer. So I come out of the tradition where wherever you started, we were all trying to make the same revolution. And we had maybe a little distance of divisions of labor, and, but we only were trying to be generalists. So there's nothing more general than the climate. I'm convinced, I mean, I'm not, I've been convinced that we're talking decades of the most revolutionary change in the history of the planet. Uh, here's an example of uh, 2040, they're talking about 
a tipping point in Los Angeles at 2048, where if we don't stop it, it's going to be uh, um, floods, droughts, yeah. heat waves. But the UN is the arena where I think the critical mm -hmm. fight is taking place. So two quick questions. One is how do you go from the general to the specific? Because right. you've talked in the past about how you organize bus riders because that's the daily up close experience. And then you connect to the other aspects of a person's life to build the sort of revolutionary cohort that you, you described that you work with at the center. So how do you go from something close to someone's life and then something so abstract as many years from now, there'll be floods. Um, well, and then secondly, yeah, sure, how please. do you make impact on organizations like the United Nations? You have to say, we haven't had good luck so far. Well, I can't answer all the questions, but I'll tell you those that are the right questions, right. and I'll tell you the best answers I have. Uh, when we go on the bus now, we say to people, we have three demands we want you to understand. One, President Obama must cut U.S. emissions of greenhouse gases by 50% of 1990 levels by 2025. Mm -hmm. Two, President Obama must contribute $10 billion to the Green Climate Fund to move money to the third world because we're the cause of the problem. And third, President Obama must end the 1033 program, which is a defense department program that gives tanks and weapons to the police department to suppress us. So we're not asking anymore about, frankly, about the bus fare. People get it pretty quick. Well, let's start with the first one. Well, mm -hmm. what, what's going on? Well, did you know about this Paris mm -hmm. conference? No, nobody ever asked me. Well, of course, nobody. We're here to get you mm -hmm. in South mm -hmm. LA. Well, President Obama, how can we influence him? I do not have a clue. That man is in a Teflon mm -hmm. protection, not just from the Democratic Party, but from many forces in the black community who correctly, because of the racist treatment of this president, feel this is not the time. And the conference, we talk about the Paris conference, will be insulated also physically as well as anything else. It's not <coughs> happening in, you know, near the Arc de Triomphe or anything. No, but the good thing is that we're going to go, we're working in two structures. One is called the Global Network for Demanding Climate Change Now, and that's inside the UN. And there the fight is over getting a document mm -hmm. that all the governments can agree on. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I will tell you, spoiler alert, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But our goal is to make President Obama uncomfortable in Paris at a time when he's trying to have a, a love fest and a coronation. A sort of legacy moment. A legacy moment. And we want to say to people, can you get 1990 as a number, 50% as a number, and now as a number? So will there be clear demands from this conference, I mean, from this set of protests in the way that there weren't in New York at the Climate Justice March? I think what the Strategy Center is trying to do, because I'm going to Paris, and then I'm going to be going to Bonn, and then we're going to go to Paris again. Inside the protesters, our main consciousness struggle is, guess what? White Europeans are not at the center of the world, mm -hmm. and the demands must be for the third world primarily. Mm -hmm. Inside the UN, the demand is get the president of the United States and the EU mm -hmm. to come to terms with this 50% reduction. I don't believe either will be successful mm -hmm. in the sense of winning the majority, but they will change the terms of the debate if we're successful. Is there a danger that you get so many people so focused on an issue that's so far away from them, home, their home, that they spend all this money and time going to try to be heard in the streets just outside Paris um, instead of working where they live? Well, we're organizing in South LA, and we're building this movement in South LA to make demands on the president now mm -hmm. in South LA. We don't think, you're absolutely right, Paris is where he's going to be. I'm not going to, five of us are going to go right. to Paris and make the president, no. But we, we, if we can make, before he leaves office, mm -hmm. South LA to be a place where he is uncomfortable, and where South LA says, we are on, on to you, President Obama, you still are putting tanks in our community, you're about to destroy L.A. That's the uphill yeah. battle, but that's the core of my work. And that military equipment coming to police departments around the country isn't right. good for the environment either. That's correct. Part of the research that you've done. And just one more thing. What you're absolutely right about is the challenge is can we change grassroots organizing to do bigger picture? Yeah. I have to say, you know, you've been in this a long time. There have been a lot of crises of capitalism. Neoliberalism seems to be our economic system of capital first, seems to be as strong as ever, uh, instability notwithstanding. How do we change that? 
Well, I think one of my weaknesses is I don't focus as much on the economic base as I should because I have an aversion to how people keep talking about economics separate from race, separate mm -hmm. from military, separate from imperialism. I understand imperialism at its core is an economic system. Sure. I understand it's the highest stage of capitalism, as Lenin said, but I also know it's a racist, Eurocentric, Christian, sadistic system that started in an economic base, but its behavior goes beyond a, a simply, this is the economy and therefore they do bad things. Why is there a million black people in prison? It's not just because of capitalism, it's the specific evolution of capitalism in the United States to be a sadistic, racist, imperialist system. So, yes, I think... Don't forget the patriarchy. I do forget the patriarchy too often. I mean it. And it's a, it is a patriarchal system. And the colonization of women. And I am reading Maria Mies, and I am trying to up my game good, on that. Good. You know, well, and we'll I, check I, back in with you. All right, that. next time it won't happen again, okay? And, but I am working on that. And yeah. I work, obviously, so I think that's absolutely right. The colonization, I think Maria Mies has done some interesting stuff around, and Vandana Shiva around something that I'm still trying to learn about the relationship of colonization imperialism, suppression of women, exploitation of women. Yeah, comes back to how do you treat your mother? My mom treated me real good, and I treated her real good. And she's the central moral force in my life. I think about her every day. And her work was largely, mostly unpaid. Yeah, and my wife, Leanne Hurst, has uh, been pushing very hard on patriarchy. It's great talking to you, Eric. Finally, I can't let you go without talking about why the centrality of New Orleans what we learned from Katrina. We've only got about a minute, but you keep going back there, so do we. Why? There's 100,000 black people missing from New Orleans. If that's not a genocidal climate crime, you tell me what is. And what's terrifying is the country's acceptance of something as enormous, as if that's a past experience. I will not die before we demand and get those 100 million black, 100,000 black people back to New Orleans. So it, it's, I don't like when something happens and people talk about it in the past. The right never gives up. We have to get 100,000 black people back to New Orleans. You can find out more about the Labor Community Strategy Center and all of the work of the incredible people Eric is working with. Eric Mann, thanks so much for all that you do and thanks for coming into the program. Thanks, Laura. The world's most powerful countries are always instructing the less powerful on best practices, but sometimes their advice is not taken, as in the case of Ecuador under the presidency of Rafael Correa. Correa and his team inherited a ghastly debt and economic doldrums. They did just about everything the international banks told them not to do. I was in Ecuador last summer and was able to ask the man who was finance minister at that time what happened. He's Pedro Paez. In uh, 2007, we uh, started a new popular government uh, with the mandate to finish with the austerity policies. All the uh, Washington consensus policies had rendered our country um, totally deindustrialized. The people was really uh, upset, and we toppled three presidents. Along three, uh, along ten years, no. So uh, what happened was that uh, the people said that's enough, enough is enough, and let's go for a, a national majority ch to change the country. We have to reinvent pos uh, possibilities in terms of the treasury, in terms of the rehabilitation of the public banking that had been crippled, systematically crippled during the previous decades. In the first uh, uh, year, uh, on top of the increase in, uh, in uh, public investment, we tripled the amount of uh, loans from the, from the public banks in order to promote development. Wow. The agricul uh, Agricultural Bank, the, the Development Bank. Uh, domestically, we uh, have uh, enhanced the possibilities also of the credit unions. Uh, the connection and the, 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 the training and the, the transactionality of the small uh, credit unions and uh, financial cooperatives and the uh, cajas de ahorro, the small communal banks, 
that increase the possibilities of uh, the level of the territory and the community. Mm. We uh, are trying to multiply the operators in the markets and uh, to raise the possibilities for the, for example, uh, from the territory, from the communities with the grassroots organizations, uh, trying to organize uh, and to enhance the productive forces at the level of the provinces, at the level of the counties, at the level of the parishes. And uh, we had plenty of, of, uh, of new organizations now with the uh, productive assemblies that we had uh, uh, provoked, we had facilitated uh, all around the country in order to um, take advantage of uh, the new venues that uh, had been opened, for example, in terms of the supermarkets. For the first time, the supermarkets had to give some place for the production of the popular economy, for the production of the indigenous communities, the artisans, the, the, the peasants, the self-employed that uh, had been excluded all this time. Breaking down with the whole tradition that uh, even uh, ideological and psychological assumes that everything that we do is worthless, that the only thing that uh, is worthy is the, the production that came from abroad, yeah. all the imports. Th all this complex of inferiority had not only damaged our economy and the dynamics of the society, but had also a, a, a poisoned our soul. And uh, as a part of this uh, transformation of the society, is this real, yes, we can, has to start for the conviction that it is possible to destroy all this ocean of impossibilities that had uh, uh, suffocated our, our life and to um, use even the market without any illusion about the market as a panacea, but to take advantage even of the mechanisms of the market in order to, uh, uh, to take uh, the most of ourselves. That was Pedro Paez, Ecuador's former finance minister, in an interview I recorded this summer, thanks to his office for their assistance. The heads of 19th century African states, when they found their authority bypassed by colonial traders and their land and people savaged by powers beyond their control, sought to reassert their authority by erecting scary little statues with the community's rules literally nailed into their chest. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Every pledge made by the Congo people was marked by a spike for all to see. The gods would punish transgressors, the priests promised, and the magic potion used to summon the spirits was buried in the statues' stomachs. Some of those statues, called Minkondi, have been on display at the Metropolitan Museum this fall, and I couldn't help but think of them as the UN meets for the 21st time to draft an agreement to defend the climate. National leaders, finding their countries colonized by corporations beholden to no one, are doing their best to reassert their control. But what if, after 21 meetings, they finally agree on a document? Will it be any more effective than the Minkondi? Determined, muscular, knees bent, ready to jump, those little guys looked scary and protective too, but they weren't. They marked the desperate last gasp of an old way of life, and now they're behind glass at the Met. When we paid homage there recently, I couldn't help noticing the magic potion was all dried up. The source of their power, after all, lay not in the priests or the chieftains or the potions, but the people specifically in the traditional belief that antisocial behavior was wrong and would bring consequences. The first transgressor to injure one without incurring consequences from all proved that jig was up. All these years on, two centuries of no consequences later have brought us to this brink. Can we learn from the Congo? Nail as many hammers and spikes as you like into our chest. Nothing substitutes for a living, breathing, social contract.
Today on the show, Jalal Sabur and Ray Figueroa tell us how they're connecting farming to restorative justice. The character of real estate development thus far in New York City has been very, very predatory, very rapacious. We're talking about gaining our power through land. And fisherman Bren Smith talks about saving the earth and jobs with kelp. All that and a few words from me on giving thanks and growing food power. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on the program, we're going to look back at the mobilization that brought the world the global march for climate justice. What went into it? What are some of the lessons that activists are taking from it? And where does that movement go next? Mm -hmm. 